So in this video, we're going to be looking at the intertemporal labor and leisure choice. Labor and leisure. So we have previously been looking at our two period model in which we have consumption and saving and households just take their income as given. They have some income in period one, Y1 and some income in period two, Y2. And then they just have to choose how much they want to consume in period one and how much they want to consume in period two. However, in real life, we don't just get some income magically given to us. We have to, usually, at least, we have to work to get income. So this model endogenizes the labor supply and we are choosing how much labor we want to supply in order to get income that we can then spend on consumption. And this is a labor leisure choice because we assume that we get some sort of utility from leisure, which I know in real life people tend to do with a bit of free time. You can do whatever you want. You can watch a film or say learn a new skill or whatever. And so leisure gives us some sort of utility. So this is why there's a trade-off and it's a choice between labor and leisure, because by working, we can earn money to spend on consumption, but by not working, we can you, we can have more leisure time, which we also get utility from. So let's write out our preferences. So we get utility, and our utility function is still additively separable as we had before. So we first look at our utility in period one, and we still get utility from consumption in period one, but now this also depends on how much leisure we have. How much leisure do we have? Well, it's 24 hours in the day, and we subtract from that how many hours we work in the day, and whatever's left is how many hours we have left for leisure. We're, we're not gonna assume anything about how long we sleep, and, we'll, and we'd make this, say, 16 hours in a day, minus labor time, we're just gonna say 24 hours in a day for simplicity, and so we have 24 hours of leisure minus how much we work, and we add on to this the discounted value of utility from period two, and our period two utility comes from consumption in period two, and from how much leisure we have in period two, which again is 24 hours minus how much we work. Now, now we have our utility function, and we obviously want to maximize our utility, but we do have a constraint. We still have a budget constraint, which says that we can only consume as much as as much income as we have. But we don't just have Y1 and Y2 anymore. We Our income comes from the wage rate multiplied by how many hours we work. We get paid by the hour in this model. So our budget constraint looks like this. We get income in period one from our, the wage rate multiplied by how many hours we work, plus our income in period two, which is the wage rate in period two, multiplied by how long we work in period two, and we're looking at present value, so we still discount by the interest rate. And so our income, our present value income, which is what we have at the moment, is equal to our present value of consumption, which is the same as we had in the previous intertemporal budget constraint. It's just consumption in period two plus the discounted value of consumption in period two. So that's our maximization problem we want to maximize utility subject to this budget constraint and if you know in the past we were maximizing with respect to just consumption in period one and period two but now we have a more complicated problem we are maximizing where we have choice over four things we're choosing our consumption in each period and we're choosing how much labor to uh, how much time to work in periods one and two so from this we can write our lagrangian which says we're maximizing the objective function, which is these utilities, which are, which are above 24 minus L1 plus beta utility in period two, which depends on these two variables. And then we subtract the constraint multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier. Now I don't have enough space to write this constraint out, but you can see it there. Just imagine that that constraint is in there, and that's our Lagrange function. So, okay, we should know how to solve the Lagrangian. It's, we just take first order conditions with respect to all of our choice variables. 
So we have a first order condition where we differentiate the Lagrange unit with respect to C1, with respect to C2, with respect to labor in period one and labor in period two. And out of this, we get four equations, which we said equal to zero because they're first order conditions. And they all have the Lagrange multiplier lambda in them. So we, that's a terrible lambda, but we get a lambda in each of these. And we can then use this lambda to substitute, say, C1, our C1 equation into our C2 equation. And we can also substitute, say, our C1 into our L1 equation, our L1 into our L2 equation, and so on. And then we can get a number of equations out of this. And so I'm not going to do all of these first order conditions and all the substitutions. It should be fairly simple algebra and um, differentiation. So instead, I will just write down what the solutions are to some of these substitutions. So the first first order condition that we derive is that we have our utility where we have differentiated with respect to L1. And this is in terms of, whoops, that's not right, 24 minus L1. And we can divide that by our Lagrangian or our utility function differentiated with respect to C1. Um, this depends on C1, and this is equal to the wage rate in period 1. So we call this the static, uh, let's get a blue pen, we call this the static consumption labour consumption labour choice. So for, for this equation, you can clearly see that we have substituted together the consumption in period one and the labor in period one. And so this equation is not dynamic, it is static. So it is just in period one that we're looking. And this relation is how we trade off at optimum our labor and consumption choice. So, and it intuitively makes a lot of sense that this is equal to the wage rate because the marginal benefit of adding or spending one extra unit of time in the labor force, we get out the wage rate. So at optimum, the marginal cost of in increasing our time in the labor force is also going to be the wage rate. As we know, as economists, we need our marginal benefit to be equal to our marginal cost at optimum. So that is what this condition says, that at optimum we have this static consumption labour equation satisfied at optimum. So that's the first equation we look at. Uh, let's write down another result from substituting in some of these equations. If we, if we substitute in the C1 and C2 equations into each other, we get out a familiar result where we have utility differentiated or the marginal utility of C1 is equal to the discount rate multiplied by the interest rate multiplied by our marginal utility of C2. Now I have I have usually been writing these derivatives with as u primed, but I've now changed it such that I I subscript them with what I've differentiated with respect to because we have multiple variables so. Uh, we'll subscript with C when we're differentiating with respect to consumption and subscript with L when we're differentiating with respect to labor. But as we can see, this equation is one that we are familiar with. This is the Euler equation. We've derived that before, so I won't go over the intuition behind it. But we still have the same Euler equation that we've had in previous videos where we just had a consumption choice in period one and two. We didn't even worry about labor. But at optimum, this trade-off still has to be true because if it wasn't true, then we could increase our consumption in one period and increase our utility, whereas we're at optimum, so that shouldn't be possible, so the Euler equation has to hold still. And the final equation that we'll write down is one that we derive by trading or by substituting labor one and the labor two equations into each other, so we get a dynamic equation. Uh, just as the Euler equation is a dynamic equation, 
and we get that the marginal utility of labor in period one over the marginal utility of labor in period two is equal to this term. We have the discount rate plus the, or multiplied by the interest rate, uh, multiplied by our wage in period one over our wage in period two. And we call this our Euler equation for labor and leisure. Labor and leisure. And to further add to this, we can take a look at what this equation says about our intertemporal labor and leisure choice, because that is the topic of this video. So let's uh, consider that we increase the interest rate R. Uh, as we can see, that factors into the equation here. Well, if we increase our interest rate R, this means that we are going to increase our work in period one or increase labor one. We substitute work tomorrow, which is given by L2, into work today. So how, how do we tell this from the equation? Well, if we increase R on the right-hand side here, this increases the right-hand side. So that means we're going to have to to make this hold with equality, we're going to have to increase the left-hand side of this equation. How do we do that? By increasing the numerator or by decreasing the denominator. And what I'm saying is that we do a combination of both. We increase the numerator a bit and we decrease the denominator a bit such that the until we get that this condition at optimum still holds. So we increase our labor in period one and decrease our labor in period two. Sorry that this is getting very messy. But why do we do that? Because if we have a higher interest rate, as I've said here, this means that we can, or the optimal thing to do is to increase our labor in period one. So then we increase our income in period one, increase Y1. And so we can then save this at a higher interest rate and so we can increase our consumption in period two even more because we are saving at a high interest rate so we have this we have this trade-off of labor leisure and consumption and if we increase our interest rate we're going to want to increase our work tomorrow or work today and decrease our work tomorrow so another sorry this is getting messy I'm going to scribble out the increase in R stuff let's get rid of this and consider that something else changes so now let's consider that we increase the ratio of W1 to W2 which factors into our equation here well, what does increasing this ratio mean? Let, let's imagine it just says that we increase our wage in period one and we keep our wage in period two the same. Well, very intuitively, if we increase our wage in period one, we're going to want to work more in period one. And, but we have a trade-off that we might want to decrease our work in period two. Even though the wage has stayed the same, we, we are a two period, we're maximizing over two periods. So the optimal thing to do, this equation says, is to increase our labor offered in period one and decrease it in period two. Because we can, what we can do in this scenario is we can earn extra income from each hour worked in period one and then reap the benefits in period two where our wage is still the same. And this equation says that that's the optimal thing to do. So if we increase this ratio here, then we want to increase labor in period one and decrease in period two. So from those two exercises we've just carried out, we can now construct a labor supply curve. Uh, we'll call this labor supply in period one. And our labor supply in this model just depends on the interest rate and the ratio of our wages. Uh, this could depend on any number of other things, but we're only going to focus on these two factors at the moment because that's what our Euler equation for labor and leisure says. And from the exercise we just carried out, we see that it depends positively on the interest rate and positively on the ratio of the wages for period one labor.
So that just about wraps up this video. Make sure to check out the playlist for the next video, which will be on developing a labor demand curve. And then we can start looking at equilibrium in the labor market. And make sure to subscribe for all my future videos and do drop a like if this was at all useful.